It's Alive, part two of the mostly printed CNC Lowrider 2. This is a mostly printed CNC, or a Lowrider 2 to be exact. In part one of this series, I 3D printed all of the red parts, cut out three timber frame pieces, and assembled it with cheap pipe and a kit from the V1 engineering website. When we left off, it could move by hand, but nothing more. You can see I've made quite a lot of progress, and by the end of this video, if you follow along, it will be completely assembled, wired, and running with a self-squaring dual end stop firmware. So let's get started. In the first episode, I assembled my MPCNC without cutting down any of the pipes. There is a calculator available on the website, but instead I chose to have everything aligned, put some tape in place, and use an electric saw and linisher to clean it up. Of course, you could always use a hacksaw if you didn't have these tools. Deburring is a must to avoid future injuries. Probably one of the worst parts of this whole project was cleaning off the stickers from the pipe. Even with acetone, it seemed to take forever. I cut my vertical pipes to match the length of the lead screw, and for the horizontal X axis, I marked them to get them even, and then used tape before cutting them the same way. I thought I had them perfect, but I soon realized two of the parts were backwards. Two of the caps had to be switched to put the Vs on the outside of the machine. With all of the cutting and therefore metal shavings gone, I figured it was a good time to add the lubrication. I filled the lead screw nut full of grease and then ran it up and down several times to spread it evenly. Time to mount the belts, and there's a fair few diagrams on the assembly page, so I followed them to put everything together. For the X axis, the belt ribs need to face up, and then I poked them down through the hole and carefully guided them around the stepper pulley to get them into place. You then make a loop on one end with the teeth interlocking with themselves, and a couple of stray bits of belt with a cable tie hold everything together. There's an internal channel on the end cap that you thread a cable tie through and that will be used to hold as well as tension the belt. Here's that diagram one more time and we're going to use a small printed piece you can just see poking out. It was hard to film anything besides the back of my hand, but the piece goes in between the cable tie and the folded over belt. The Y axis belt holders have three marks. The V1 logo is like an arrow and must point towards the center of the table. The thicker portion should be on the top to cover where the belt will be. And the two slots should face away from the center of the table and that's where the cable tie will go. There are two mounting holes and I think it's suggested that you drill it straight into the side of your table. After this, we can prepare the Y belts. This time the ribbing needs to face inwards and once again I chose to thread it through the middle before attaching each end. This can be a little bit tricky to get everything aligned, but if you use some pliers and or tweezers, you should be able to get everything where it needs to be. The mounting system is exactly the same as before. You thread a cable tie through, put a loop, the little printed piece in place, and then everything threads through and is tightened with the zip tie. When you've only got one end attached, you should tension it a little bit for now, just enough to stop the printed piece from falling out. For the other end, I found that lining it up and cutting it with the very end of the table gave it the perfect length when it was folded back to make a loop. Everything connects as before, and in this time, you can get the cable tie and tension it completely. I found after installing all three belts, I still had a fair amount left over. It's time to download the firmware, and to do that, we head to the GitHub page. There's a nice set of instructions here to explain all the different versions available for download. We're using an MPCNC. It doesn't matter whether you're using the standard one or the lowrider. I'm firstly gonna set this up with a ramps, we're using all standard kit parts, so that means the T8 lead screw is fine, and I'll also use one of the default full graphic RepRap LCDs. Therefore, we can come down and match up our combo. MPCNC, ramps, T8, LCD, 32 step. And we can download that zip. There's a page for the ramps mainboard that we're now going to work through. To match the instructions, I'm using DRV8825 stepper motor drivers. I have all three jumpers in on the ramps board, and I'm inserting them so the chip is on the right hand side and above the jumpers. Now I wanted to set the VREF for the stepper motors so I started by looking up the model on the website. A quick Google search told me that they could handle a max current of two amps. The formula for these drivers is 0.9 times the current divided by two. This works out very simply of a VREF of 0.9 volts. To set the VREF you need to power the mainboard from the 12 or 24 volt supply 
Attach an alligator clip to the red probe and then a screwdriver. The black probe goes onto the negative input terminal and then the screwdriver goes onto the trim pot which will read the V-Ref. Twist the trim pot very slowly until you reach your desired target. I set mine just below the 0.9 volts that we just established. For a ramps, your power supply needs to go into both input terminals. So I daisy chained the positive in red and I'd previously soldered the black underneath as well. Marlin needs at least one extruder and with nothing plugged in, will receive a minimum temperature error. To get around this, you can attach a resistor to the thermistor input. I crimped one in a DuPont connector and it plugged in nicely. As you can see, the firmware now thinks it's reading the temperature. Now to wiring the steppers, and there's two ways to do it. And the kit I bought came with the series wiring kit. It's basically got one straight extension cable for the X axis, and then a one into two for the Y and the Z. Here's my series kit wiring, untangled and laid out on my bench. The website provides a nice diagram that we're going to be referencing as we plug in our cables. We'll start with the Y axis and we're going to take a female plug from one of the series cables and plug it in as shown to the main board. Then we'll take the two male ends and they plug into the steppers that are on the external sides of the machine. Don't worry about matching colours, we're going to fix that later. Next we'll do something very similar for the Z axis. We're going to plug in the single female cable into the main board and then plug in the two male ones into the steppers that are at the outer top edge of the machine. That should leave one dangling wire, and that's for the X-axis stepper motor. We simply plug that into the remaining port on the main board, labelled X in the diagram. We're now ready to flash the firmware that we downloaded and unpacked as a zip file from the GitHub. We need to come inside the Marlin folder, and there'll be a marlin.ino file which will open up in the Arduino IDE. If you've never done this before, the good news is you'll have to change very little to get it working. Assuming you're using an LCD, you need to install the library for that by coming to Sketch, Include Library, Manage Libraries. We're then going to search for UHGLIB. You can see that I have the UHGLIB library installed. If you don't, you'll have a button over in the lower right, like comes up for this library here. Apart from that, all we need to do is to come up to Tools and set our port that it is connected to. Make sure the board is set to an Arduino Mega or Mega 2560 and then hit the upload button. With the firmware flashed, it's now time to test all of our stepper motor connections. We're going to go to motion, move axis and go through each one every time by one millimeter. For the X, as the number increases, we want the axis to travel to the right, but you can see here mine is backwards. For the Y, we want it to go to the top as the number increases and move towards us as the number decreases and once again mine is plugged in backwards. Finally for the Z, we want up for positive and down for negative. But if you watch carefully, mine actually twists, going down on one side and up on the other. To fix all of this, we start by unplugging the machine. If the movement for the entire axis, like my X and Y, is incorrect, simply plug it in at the main board in reverse. I did this to fix my X and Y axes, and you can see the X here is now working correctly. If your Y or Z axis is twisting like I had, you need to reverse just one of the plugs in the extension series cable. As you can see here, my Z now goes up and down, and the machine is connected correctly. Technically, the machine is now working, but in this simple form, the next step would be to square everything up and then probably print a cover for the Ramps Electronics. But for this one, I've gone a lot further, fitting an SKR 1.3 32-bit mainboard, TMC 51 silent stepper motor drivers, a customized LCD touchscreen, and self-squaring dual end stop homing. Let's go through this step by step. The reason I wanted auto squaring is that after you've set up the machine nicely, it's very easy to knock it out of alignment and have to do it again. To run firmware with auto squaring, we won't be running any series cabling. Instead, we need to directly connect all five stepper motors. We can only do this with a mainboard that has five stepper motor driver outputs. By default on each of these, we have X, Y, and Z, and then two extruders. But really what we want is X, Y, Z, Y2, and Z2. There's only one problem, and that's that Marlin requires at least one extruder, and we've left that out. The dual end stop firmware available for ramps has a rather clever solution. They set all the pins for extruder 0 to a pin that's not being used, in this case 70, 
move extruder zero's pin assignments to extruder one, create a new extruder two, and give it extruder one's pin assignments. It's explained well on the dual end stop firmware page, and that's that they move extruder zero and then shuffle the other two down one slot. And that's exactly what I did for the SKR 1.3 pins file. I've set the original extruder zero pins to P205, which is the connection for the heated bed that we'll no longer be using, and then shuffled the E0 pins to E1 and the E1 pins to a new E2. I've also done a range of other tweaks, but don't worry, you don't need to understand them. I've got the firmware for download in the description. Just put the file on the SD card into the SKR version 1.3 and reset it and you'll be done. I did try to set this up with sensorless homing, but it just didn't work. As you can see, this stretched and busted the Z lead screw couplers and I needed to replace them with some solid spares that fortunately I had on hand. This meant I needed a range of micro switch holders, so here's what I designed. Well actually this first one I didn't design because I found it on Thingiverse and it worked just fine. For each of the switches you're about to see, I used two M2x10 bolts to hold them in place and wired up the common and normally open pins. With a 30mm M3 nut and bolt, it's retained to one of the horizontal rails and this positions it to meet the centre carriage nicely when it homes to the left for the X axis. This next one was a remix of that part and I used them to home the Z axis vertically. As you can see there's a standard and a mirrored version and this is how they get installed. Each of them clip onto the other horizontal rail facing downwards so that when it lowers it contacts the carriages below. The final pieces screw into the wooden Y plate on each side of the machine. Once again there's a standard and mirrored version and we're going to attach them using 16mm self tapping screws. If you've already got the machine assembled like I did, to install them you'll have to temporarily remove the micro switch. Then if you lift up the Y carriages on each side and wedge something heavy underneath it, it'll prop it up to give you temporary access. The idea is that you install them on the side that you want the machine to home towards and they touch the underside of the printed part that holds the skate wheel. This should keep them consistent from left to right as will making sure the tapered piece is sitting flat against the timber slope. Next up, I found this MKS Gen L case, and if you didn't know, it has the same mounting pattern as the SKR 1.3. I designed these very simple mounting brackets to go with that case, and you need to print a pair of these. My piece of aluminium angle was 25mm wide, and as you can see, I let it overhang by 90mm on the left hand side. You can see the two printed brackets go on either end of the case, and clamp it to the aluminium securely. With all of this in place, I think it's finally time to explain how to connect all the wiring. If you're running the dual end stop firmware, you have five separate stepper motor drivers, therefore nothing is shared, and ideally you'd start with this wiring kit here. Fortunately, there was enough spare cabling in my series kit that I could cut and recrimp connectors and extend the three stepper motor cables that wouldn't reach the left hand side control box. Just remember, whenever you have one of these junctions, use some tape so it can't accidentally wiggle loose. The diagrams to come refer to a low rider setup as you're seeing it here. When it talks about left and right Z and Y steppers, this is what it's referring to. Plugging in the stepper motors is pretty self-explanatory, but what might be confusing is where the end stops plug in. You can see for Y that the right hand micro switch plugs in on the left hand side and vice versa, and this is different to the Z axis. And that's because I've set up my machine to home to the top left of my table. You can see that's in the X and Z minus direction, but it's in the Y positive direction, and that's why those two are flipped. If you want yours to home to the lower left, you'll need to update the firmware as well as where the switches plug in. I got everything plugged in before worrying about cable management. Here you can see my extenders and where the wiring goes into the back of the control box. To tidy up the delicate wiring on the Y plates and to prevent it from getting caught in moving parts, I drilled a series of holes before threading through a cable tie and using it to secure the wires in place. This lets you eliminate randomly dangling wires and it also means you can put a little bit of strain relief to prevent the cables work hardening and then snapping. After tidying everything up with cable ties, I chose to use this Velcro back sleeving to wrap everything up even more. Its main advantage is you don't need to thread the wires through the middle. It simply wraps around with the wires already set up and then the Velcro secures everything. I let it overhang the end of the aluminium channel just a little bit with a cable tie to secure everything tightly. 
This should prevent the wires from rubbing on the end of the aluminium and being severed. I followed the instructions and used these Velcro pieces to hold everything securely and neatly to the aluminium extrusion. I also wrapped up my x-axis wires with enough slack that it could reach the full extent of its treble on the left and right hand side of the machine. The way the cable hangs down and in the way needs to be fixed however. Earlier on you saw me testing with an LCD and this is set up quite well in terms of firmware but it does take a long time to navigate to each menu to control each axis. My solution is an MKS TFT although they're generally set up for 3D printing. Therefore, I hit Photoshop and set up some custom graphics specific to this machine and configured the firmware to suit. These files are available for free in the description and let me run you through the changes. Firstly, it offers the convenience of being able to move all three axes at the same time from the same screen. It also lets us home each axis individually as well as all at once and I've added a go to zero button as well. There's a new menu item called Job Setup where you can zero X, Y, Z or all at once and since I'm going to be using a laser, I've set up some laser controls there as well. Finally, instead of saying print, I've got a custom button that says cut, and it loads up G-code files ready for the machine to process. So let's see this fancy auto squaring in action. You can see the left hand side is definitely lower, and as it comes down, it hits that end stop first, pauses, and waits for the right hand side to catch up. When it reaches the bottom, they both lift up, come back down more slowly, and the machine is now square for this axis. It works exactly the same for the Y, which is also crooked here. The first side hits it, waits for the second, and then everything is square once again. I generated G-code for a very simple T-shape and then ran it on the machine. This is not much of a test, but I'm pleased to report that everything is working as it should be. I've got everything set up to add either a router or a laser and make some really cool stuff. There are still a few things that need my attention, however. Firstly, I've found that the cable tie system for the end of the belts is prone to coming undone, and I've noticed this great design on Thingiverse that I'm going to remix to suit my specific needs. Finally, the electronics case as I've used it is not designed for a touchscreen, and the SD card cannot be accessed. This thing is looking awesome, and I'm excited to make some really cool stuff on it. Although I'm planning to use this primarily with a laser, I'll probably fit a small trimmer router to this just to see how it goes. If you want to see both of those, hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out on future episodes. If you've got any thoughts or comments on the direction I can put this thing, or maybe something you want me to make, please leave them in the comments below. In the meantime, thanks so much for watching, and until next time, happy 3D printing your own CNC router. G'day, it's Michael again. If you like the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.